Hey guys, welcome back, Module 3D. Uh, we're just gonna focus on two people here. This is the kind of nice thing about the online things. I can I can take the chapter and kind of cut it up into a few pieces. And and yeah, I know Module 3C kind of um, went a little longer than I expected, but I'm gonna try to keep myself under control. So here we are, Module 3D, just Herbert and Fechner. So we're just gonna talk about these two individuals um, and how, you know, what they've done both relates to the things we've talked about so far, um, but also will set the stage for some things we're going to talk about going forward. All right, so just to be explicit, chapter four begins here. Again, I'll try to uh, roadmark these a little bit more. Um, so this is really the beginning of chapter four uh, that this module covers. All right. So Herbert, you know, funny, when, when I taught this course originally, um, I'd never heard of this guy uh, at all. And it's only funny because I consider myself an educational psychologist. Um, and, you know, once I read about this guy the first time, I thought, wow, this guy's interesting. I, uh, I, I like him. I like what he's done. Uh, and now I read, got to read about him again for this course. And I'm, and I'm again like, oh, yeah, yeah. Why is this guy not <laughs> more well known? So I decided I would spend a little bit of time on him um, because I think there's some cool things, not just about what he proposed and, and why it's relevant to the history of science, but I think it's also very relevant to today, right now. Um, so let's, let's kind of get there. We're, we're tying things together a little bit as we go through here. And, and so one of the things we talked about was um, when Newton talked about things like thresholds and how they worked and, and how that was sort of um, an idea that continued on. And so this is another, this is an example of that idea continuing on, um, but in a very different context. So it really kind of shows you how, you know, a central idea, if you remember Newton, he was talking about like a threshold, like how much force do you need on an object to, to sort of break the grip of friction, you know, to get it moving. Um, and so he said, you push, you push, you push, and once you hit some threshold, then it moves. Um, so that's a very general concept that Newton applied to physics. Um, but now we're going to see Herbert apply it to psychology in, in, a, in a pretty cool way. So here's what he thought of. So he was really focused on conscious experience and a lot of the early psychologists. And by the way, let me take this as a moment to say, Technically, he's not a psychologist because psychology doesn't exist yet, um, but his work is psychology. So every now and then I will call some of these people psychologists, even though technically um, that term did not yet exist. Um, but a lot of the early people interested in psychology were drawn to conscious experience um, as their first you know, sort of thing. And, and often it was like, well, there's this external world full of stuff but I can learn, look internally, and there's a world in there too. And so he was interested in that world, and he was interested in what got into that world and how. Um, and so he talked about all these ideas having different levels of energy, but if their energy, and here's the threshold, if their energy was high enough, then they could get into our consciousness. Um, and so those are the things we become aware of. But so you can imagine a line, a threshold, right? The things with enough energy, they're in our consciousness. But just below them, there are some other things that could, with just a little bit of energy, flip into the consciousness. And things that are in consciousness, if they lose a little bit of energy, could drop down below the threshold, right? So we talk about this issue of a stream of consciousness. We, we will soon meet the person who, who um, gave us that term. Uh, but the idea that consciousness seems to flow, it seems to continually change, you know, what's going on up there? Well, that's what Her Herbert was interested in. Um, and so in, in some, to some extent, he was talking about this in terms of one's ability to stay engaged on a task. So you're trying to get something done. You want your mind on this task. You want to think it through. But you know why you're thinking it through? Um, well, back in the day, I'm going, to go, I'm going to start back in the day, say when I was a student, you know, maybe my thoughts of the weekend came in and something I want to do. And so I might suddenly find myself daydreaming, right? I might find my consciousness has been stolen or, or pulled away, pulled in a different direction by some other thoughts that entered consciousness and then started to kind of take over. So he's really talking about distraction. And I think in the modern world, Distraction is, as you know, a huge issue. And, you know, a very clear example of that is the number of people being struck by cars, the number of pedestrians being struck by cars. Why? Because the pedestrians are distracted and because the drivers are distracted. 
What do we mean in Herbert's terms? Well, what we mean is while you're walking in traffic, your awareness should be on the dangers around you, right? That's what you should be paying attention to. That's what you should be thinking about. But if other things hop into your mind, um, then they can take over. And we've done something devious with these little things. It's called notifications. <laughs> so basically, Every time a phone sends you a notification, somebody shared your post or liked your post or commented on your post or did whatever, and it sends you a little, or CNN decides to send you a little whatever, um, it's kind of pushing into your consciousness. It's, it's kind of, you know, suddenly saying, hey, pay attention to me. And if you look at that thing, now you're bringing it into consciousness. You're giving it that little bit of energy. You're bringing it into consciousness, which is pushing other things out of consciousness. And it's making it very hard for us to focus on something okay so that was the real issue uh, herbert's interested in in the in the 1800s in the early 1800s he was working on this and i actually think this issue is you know how this happens how distraction actually occurs what are the processes underlying it are is potentially as relevant now if not more so than it was then so a cool little issue now he 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 also kind of so he took the threshold idea but he also kind of carried that uh, associationist idea that's, you know, very early on um, where, where associations are seen as key components to understanding the complexity of concepts we have and things like this. And so what he would say, you know, imagine these things, some over the threshold of consciousness, some under the threshold of consciousness. But he would say things are linked. And they can be linked in, in uh, excitatory ways, we would use the term now, so that you know, often when you're thinking about this one idea, that there's another idea that often goes along with that. Um, so they tend to co-occur. Or you can have, you know, often when you have that idea, there's some other idea that never occurs with it. So they could actually inhibit one another so that if you're giving energy to one, you're actually reducing the energy in the other. And so he thought these associations between concepts so for example, a notification comes in that your post was shared and that gets into your awareness. And suddenly now, anything related to that idea that just got in, you know, what were you actually posting about? Who, who shared it? Who liked it? Whatever. Um, this, anything associated with that thing in your head now might gain some energy. Some things might gain energy from that. Things related to that distraction. Things unrelated to that distraction, for example, what you're trying to think about, uh, might actually be inhibited. Uh, and so it might get pushed out of consciousness. And instead, you know, this, this idea that just kind of came in is now bringing its friends with them in a sense, and kicking out the ones that it doesn't, it doesn't like. Uh, and so it really is a model of how distraction can overtake our minds. Now, um, he, he thought association was critical, and he, critically, he built those all into a mathematical approach. Um, and we walked through the mathematical approach in the textbook, um, just kind of, um, you know, describing his notion of, of how two concepts, A and B, um, can either uh, inhibit one another or whatnot. So, so you know, check that out for, for the details of the mathematics. It's not fancy. Um, I think the critical purpose here, though, is to just realize that, you know, this is Pythagoras, right? So, so here's a guy who's taken the concept of thresholds, the concept of associations, and this desire to express things mathematically, right? Uh, what exactly what Newton did, um, you know, kind of what Kant said would be a, a problem. Um, a lot of people took that as a challenge, and that's going to be a sort of theme of today's lecture. So Her Herbert being the first one, um, and then we'll go on and talk about Fechner as, as a, another one to answer that challenge. So can you, you know, something is is abstract as how things get in or out of our consciousness can you represent that mathematically and if you can represent it mathematically are you getting at the truth of the situation right this theme is going to be all through the course so herbert's a really interesting character for kind of bringing together some of those things um, in his thinking about consciousness it wasn't his only um, sort of area of, of work he's he worked in a number of areas and the other one that the textbook highlights oh yeah i'm going to get to this but but yeah it's based on this is his educational psychology work so to get there you know, so imagine, you know, you're, you're one of these disgruntled students who say, why is learning so horrible? Why are classes so horrible? Why, why can't this be much more interesting and much more fun? 
if I had my way, I would redesign the way learning works, the way classes work, and I, I, I would make it better. Um, you know, many of us felt like that as undergraduates, and, and you might feel like that. Um, and, and it's very easy to kind of complain about the way things are done. Um, much harder to say, here's the right way. Here's what you guys should be doing. And this is what Herbert tried to do. He kind of took his notion of consciousness and, and, um, and a core aspect of it and then kind of brought it into educational psychology. So to understand it, you have to start with this idea of apperception. Um, and so this is apperceptive. It gives you the same idea. So let's read this. Comprehension using past experiences. The comprehension or assimilation of something such as a new idea in terms of previous experiences or perceptions. So the idea here is if a learner is coming into a situation, um, they have to connect this new information they're getting um, that you want them to learn this new information, but they come in with a bunch of information already. So really their challenge isn't to learn that new information so much as is to understand that new information in the context of everything they already know. Um, and that's why we see words like assimilation, right? Adding this new information to what we already have. And, and Herbert actually thought that's what conscious processing does, you know, and, and so he talked about the apperceptive state there um, in his model of consciousness. But he also took this notion and talked about how classrooms should work. Uh, and, you know, with his associationism, with a lot of the concepts. So I think it's a really interesting example um, of, of some of the theoretical ways to do it, to do things. So specifically, let's just go through this to, to give you a sense of how he connected it, because I think it's kind of cool. He said, if you are going to um, teach some concept to a class, let's say, there are five critical steps that you should attend to as you do preparation, presentation, association, generalization, and application. Okay, he said this creates the most powerful learning. So what are these things? Preparation. Um, his, his notion here is students do not just come and sit in front of their computer, in this case, ready to pick up the new information that they have. You have to kind of get their mind ready. You have to prepare them for the new information that's going to come. And, you know, one of the explicit ways you see chapters do this sometimes, and you'll see some lecturers do it, and I'm starting to think I should be doing it more, actually. Um, you may see me start to do it more, is at the beginning of a lecture, Maybe I will start doing this actually at the beginning of a lecture to say, here's what we're going to cover. And, and here are the big points we're going to hit today um, and kind of get you warmed up. Right. OK, so do you know where we're going to go and you know what we're going to talk about? OK, cool. Now let's start talking about it. OK, so that was the first thing. Prepare the student, help them get their mind where it needs to be um, to learn material. By the way, this is another reason why so many of us are uh, worried about technology in the classroom. Because you can get a student's mind where you want it, and then they can get a text message that brings their mind somewhere else totally, right? Which is Herbert's stuff, right? And so suddenly they're out of where you want them to be. And, and you guys are all armed with these things that are constantly stealing your attention away from us. Um, I'm going to connect this to office hours in just a second. You wait. I'll talk about this. Um, so, so at any rate, you know, in, in Herbert's day, he didn't have to worry about that. He kind of owned the students and all they had were their daydreams. That's the only thing that could pull them away. Um, and so his idea was, no, no, if you get them ready to learn at the beginning of class, then you've got their mind in the right place. OK, so now you're going to start talking about whatever. And, and in this case, he thought engagement was critical, that the students needed to find this information engaging. He, this is something I'm interested in, by the way. I've, I've written chapters on, on the characteristics of what makes something engaging. He highlighted interest, OK, so that you have to somehow present the information in a way that makes that shows the student why it's cool, why it's relevant, why they should want to know this. So, so you should be kind of connecting with their interest in the topic and trying to enhance that whenever you can um, with your presentation. So that's the purpose of the presentation, in fact, is to foster engagement with the material. And if you're a boring presenter, you're just not doing that step. And it's going to be hard for people to learn. OK, so now let's imagine you prepared their mind. You've given them some new information in an engaging way. Then what Herbert says is, you now, now that they have that new information, now we want to do that assimilation part, 
right? That we, were, that we were just talking about. Getting that new information and connecting it to what exists. Did you notice, you know, when I talked about Herbert, I'm connecting this to Newton, you know, connecting this to the association kind of idea, connecting this to Immanuel Kant. When you learn about this new person, if you can start to connect them with things you already know, then you, you can really make that new information durable. You can make it stick. You give it a home. You give it a place within the existing knowledge structure to sit um, by showing how it's connected to things you already learned, how it's different from other things, etc. And so he thought that was, that was critical. Right? Teach them new information and then connect it up with stuff they learn. Then get into what he called generalization. Now, this is the most vague in the textbook, but I think I can give you some concrete example. Um, so what he says is once they kind of have that, if you can give them some sort of structure, some organizational structure um, to think about this new information and maybe even to reorganize all the information they now have, um, then this can really make the learning stick. This can make it you know, become a general thing this person knows. Uh, and so one example, you might have seen this before, and, and I'll talk about it this way. In statistics courses, when you take a statistics course early on, we tend to say, here's a Z test, and here's how it works, and here's a T test, and here's how it works, and here's an F test, and here's how it works. And it's like they're all separate things. But then once you get good at statistics, um, and when you're in an upper year course, so if any of you go to graduate school or especially anything like that, you may have a professor walk in and say, you know what, a t-test is actually an F, which is actually a correlation, which is that they're all the same thing expressed a little differently because of the context in which they are in, but they all follow a very similar form. Um, and they really can be, you can, you can square a T and you have an F value. They're actually the, the sort of same thing. So when, when I had an a instructor do that to me first, it was like, oh, I thought these eight different things were eight different things. And you're telling me they're all kind of the same thing. They're just taking slightly different forms. And at first that seemed really confusing. But once I got it, now it's really easy to think of those eight different things because I know that that system. I know that structure that this thing fits within. And so it's almost a more formal way of connecting new with old. It's connecting the new and the old within a structured kind of context. And if you can do that, which you can sometimes do with new information, that makes it very resilient. People really kind of learn it. The other thing that makes it really resilient is get them to use the new information. Um, it's one thing to learn something, to get it in your memory, but you know, things like our, my, our peer scholar activities, the idea will be about, okay, you've learned about some of these characters. Now take what you learn and, and act on it. You know, you are that character now and, and respond to this prompt as though you were that character. So now you're taking the knowledge you've gained and you're using it for some new purpose. Um, that's application. Uh, and, and that's, you know, a very powerful way to make that knowledge a core part of who you are to, I say, embodying the knowledge. I, I like to say sometimes practice is what takes knowledge from your mind and puts it in your body. It makes it habit, it makes it something you do. So you can embody knowledge through practice. And that's what I'm implying there. Okay. So grand scheme of things, you know, I love this stuff because, because 200 years ago, and I think he's bang on, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of what he said still holds very much. Um, there's technologies like Top Hat that some of you have used. That's all about engagement, you know, trying to foster engagement during the presentation step. Um, and so it, it's kind of cool that something 200 years ago is still as relevant as it is today, but it's also cool because it does result from bringing together all of these different influences. And by actually doing this himself, right? What Her Herbert's doing is taking his ideas about consciousness and applying them to learning application. Um, by doing that, he's actually following Wollstonecraft's lead of saying psychology should be something you can apply. So, you know, I almost don't see a better figure than Herbert as, as reflecting the sort of convergence of a lot of these things we've talked about before coming down into this one person. So, so he's a great one for really, you know, kind of helping with, with some of this association stuff and the generalization of seeing of how it all can come together. Okay, cool little experimental psych geek moment. All right. And so now let's just go on to the next major character from this uh, chapter. And I'm not going to say a whole lot about him because I think you guys have heard quite a bit about psychophysics, but I'll, but I'll give you enough to, to remind you of what you already know, I think, and, and to hit the high points. Um, 
Gustav Fechner. Uh, you, you also hear of um, Weber. Uh, Fechner and Weber were contemporaries and they were working in a very similar area doing very similar methodologies and you know really whether a textbook chooses Fechner to highlight or Ernst Weber uh, is, is sometimes sort of a flip of the coin. Um, in this case it's Fechner and, and Fechner does get a little bit more of the credit for starting this this area of study that they called psychophysics. Psychophysics. Newton, right? Physics. Um, a mathematical capturing of the external world. Psychophysics. Let's do what Newton did, but do it to the internal world. Try to capture the mind mathematically. What's going on in the mind? That's, you know, what, what Immanuel Kant said. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you can do that. Um, well, Fechner again tried to answer that, that challenge. Now, he used, we'll talk about his procedure a little bit, but um, he used one of these procedures quite a bit. He used a number of them, as you will see, but the, the JND one, and it's sometimes just called JND, which stands for Just Noticeable Differences, um, was, was a procedure whereby he would do things like have lights of different candle power. Um, he did it with all sorts of stimulus, but let, but let me try with, let me begin with lights just to remind you slash introduce you to the, to the process procedure. He would say, okay, here's light one and here's light two. Um, they might be identical in brightness or one might be a little brighter than another. And I'm going to keep showing you these pairs of lights. And I want you to tell me whether you think one's brighter than another or not. Okay, um, and so he would show you these pairs of lights, but let's call the first one the referent. Okay, um, and, and so we can almost imagine we show them that one first and we say, okay, now is this one brighter, dimmer, or no different? Um, so where are we showing the referent? Now, critically, the referent could either be dim or bright. We could talk about how bright the referent is, you know, how, how, you know, how intense it is. Um, and what they found consistently is if you have it's something called Weber's fraction or Weber's law. Let me let me let me just put numbers to it to try to make it make it make sense. We can imagine. Let's imagine three reference. One that's ten candle power. One that's fifty candle power, and one that's two hundred candle power. Okay, just as brightness. If we did the ten, and then we show this other one, and we keep making it a little brighter than the ten, and we ask, okay, at what point can they see the difference? Let's say once it's eleven candle power, then they can see the difference. So they can tell the difference between 10 and 11. Does that mean they can see a one candle power difference? It turns out that's not true because if we go to 50 and we say, okay, here's a 50, so it's brighter now. And we say, now what about this one? And we show them 51, they can't tell the difference. 52, they can't tell the difference. 53, they can't tell the difference. Not till we get to 55 can they tell the difference. Um, so one out of 10 or five out of 50 that's where they just notice the difference. So what would it be if it was a thousand candle power? 1100. By 1100, if the other one's 1100, now they can see the difference. If it's 10,050, they won't see the difference. So here's the critical point. There was a consistent fraction, a consistent ratio of the referent to the, to the one you're making the decision about. Um, and so if the referent was dim, you could see a very little difference, but the brighter it got, the more of the difference you needed to see the difference, the more raw difference. But when you looked at how much of a difference relative to the referent, it was constant. Okay. And so that's what we call Weber's law. And so he said something like this, the change in intensity you need relative to the intensity of the referent is constant. This was very important extremely important. First of all, hey, look, 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 that's math. <laughs> Not only is it math, it's easy math. It's almost like L, uh, E equals MC squared kind of math. Um, and it held up. It, it, it predicted the data. This very simple function predicted um, people's subjective experience. So let me, let me, you know, make that critical point because we haven't talked about this that much yet and it's going to become really important. Um, scientists love when they can see what they're interested in and when they can directly measure it, right? And, the, and we call those objective measurements and that's what every scientist wants to have. Psychology, one of the things that makes it interesting is if you're interested in a person's internal world, you can't see that directly. You can't measure that directly. Uh, you need to trust that person to tell you what they're seeing. 
Um, and, and so that's what we call a subjective measure versus an object. It's got the subject in between. We have to rely on the subject to tell us what they're seeing, what's going on in their mind. And that already makes scientists uneasy. Do we trust them? Can, you know, how well can they report what's in their mind? Is this accurate data? Um, and so what, what this, you know, Weber's law and Fechner's work has shown was that, well, if I ask them whether they see one as brighter than the other, we find this nice mathematical law that predicts their answers. So maybe the subjective space, you know, is semi-regular and maybe we can trust participants um, to tell us what they're seeing in their mind. Uh, we're seeing things follow a mathematical function. And by now, you know, that's the holy grail of science. When things seem like you can predict them with math, you feel really good about your understanding. Okay, so Fechner was very, very um, big in kind of showing that that internal mental states can um, can give rise to mathematical functions. Uh, and, and that was very important as an answer to people like Kant, because, you know, literally it's like psychology is at this, this state where it might be born, but in order to be born, people have to believe that it could actually live a good life. Um, and, you know, when you have Kant saying, yeah, don't even bother, psychology can't be a science, that's like, okay, let's not bother. But now you get people like Herbert to some extent, but Fechner especially, uh, with these mathematical laws, and suddenly people are saying, hey, I think if we give birth to this thing, it might live uh, and, and become a really interesting, powerful science. Uh, and so that's why that work is so critical. I also like to highlight the following about Fechner. Again, not to get into the details, there's a there's a, um, a gray box in the textbook uh, about some of these details if you want to get into them. The bigger point I want to make is that with Fechner and with psychophysics, we started to get much more explicit procedures that we use to measure things. Uh, and so he had he would sometimes measure the absolute threshold. So this involves just a single stimulus. You know, when can you see it or not versus a difference threshold, which is what I've been talking to you about, the just noticeable difference. How, you know, when can you see the difference between two stimuli? So he studied a lot of his things, sometimes using a difference threshold, sometimes using an absolute threshold. And then even within these, he had different methods for presenting stimuli and collecting responses. Uh, and they all kind of converged on the same um, uh, conclusions. And so, yeah, so we have Fechner using very nice stringent methods, which science likes too, right? Pr procedure, process, make it, make it standardized, uh, make it something somebody else could do exactly what you do, what you did. If they read about your work, they could pick up and they should be able to do exactly what you did. And so Fechner was a step forward in that regard and getting some process to the psychology um, and making it a, still not experimental in the true sense, but we're, but we're getting there. Okay, so that was an important contribution of Fechner. Uh, and one further, just, you know, every now and then we, we talk about how somebody's work led to a new area of study or something like that. Uh, Fechner's here as well. He, he was interested in why we find certain things beautiful or pleasing. This could be music, this could be art, etc. cetera. Um, so that's called aesthetics, the psychology of aesthetics. You know, why do, why, do, why do humans find certain things positive and appealing and attractive and other things less so? Um, and, and he started playing with things like, for him it was art mostly, and he talked about art is seen from above and art is seen from below. And so what he meant by this is, if you have a piece of art and you ask somebody, is that good art? Um, there, there's sort of two approaches to answering that question. The art seen from above, um, this involves people who are art experts and they know the techniques and they know, you know, theoretically the objective things that make a piece of art a good piece of art. Uh, and so they look at, at the art and they can say, oh yeah, look at those brush strokes, look at those whatever. And they can say certain pieces of art are real art and others are not. Okay, so it's from the expert point of view. Or you can just go to the people on the street that are seeing this art and you can say, which art do you like? And, and now we're looking at, you know, the ability of our art to, to evoke these feelings in a person who may not have any expertise about art at all. Um, but we're just, you know, looking at whether they like things. What, what do they like? What do they not? Um, if you're doing the logo for your product, you don't really care whether the experts like it. 
you care whether the normal person on the street finds that an attractive um, sort of logo. So, you know, he started to see with something like aesthetics that there are these two sort of ways of coming at it. And he even connected this a little bit to um, psychological, how to get at truth, that knowledge. And, and some of this is a more philosophical approach, you know, sitting in the rationalists, as you will, sitting there and trying to figure out what... Um, what must be true versus the empiricists, which were much more uh, on the ground, collecting the data and letting the data say, you know, what's true or what's not. Um, so just kind of interesting that he connected all of those things. So two very interesting individuals, Herbert Fechner, that, that I think really show, you know, the progression of the science and how it's progressing by both building on previous ideas. And we see a lot of that in Herbert but also kind of coming up with new approaches, new methods and new findings, um, very related to psychology that, that resonate with that desire that early psychologists had to be scientific. Um, and Fechner is perhaps the best example of, of that. Okay, so there are two characters of the day. I'm gonna continue on um, with my next lecture, but for now I will stop there. Thank you.